So I'd like to welcome everyone to um, the Spring Emeriti Lecture. Um, this will be given by Fokian Kalaitis, who's a distinguished research professor and a distinguished professor emeritus of computer science and engineering. I'm Eli Silver. This introduction is usually given by the president of the Emeriti Association, but uh, Barry is away this week, so he asked me if I would do this. Um, the lecture happens twice a year, and it's a collaboration between the Emeriti Association and the Chancellor's Office. Um, the purpose is to highlight some of the many works that Emeriti faculty do for the campus and the community. Um, tonight's lecture is entitled, Some Aspects of Computational Social Choice and it's concerned with methods of collective decision making. Um, it's an interdisciplinary field between social sciences and computer sciences. Um, after the talk, there will be time for questions, and I would like to thank the chancellor. Is she here? Well, chancellor does support the series, and so we're thankful for that. Um, tonight's event will be recorded, as I've been uh, instructed, and it'll be available on the Emeriti Association's YouTube channel. Um, so now I'd like to um, invite Alexander Wolf, who is the Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering, to do a proper um, introduction. Thank you, Eli. What I'd like to do, actually, is begin by talking about computing, because I don't think that uh, we get a chance to describe our discipline uh, very much in, in, in our normal, normal jobs, a normal day. And computing is a relatively young discipline for this university. So computing is the science and engineering of automated computation that introduced radically novel ways of approaching problem formation and solution. And if you think about it, it's, it's amazing to me still, as a computer scientist myself, that an algorithm can be executed by a machine. That a set of procedure, a procedure can be communicated to a device that's fairly cold, actually can be pretty warm, <laughs> unfortunately, um, and that that machine will, will follow those instructions. The origins of computing are in mathematics and in electronics. Um, it's because of that combination is really the foundation for automated computation that depends on a mathematical, a theoretical abstraction of the machine. So in computing, we've always had this close association between mathematics and electronics, between theory and practice, and I'm going to return to that in a, in a minute. There's some notable figures in computing, and uh, aside from our speaker tonight, of course. So Charles, Charles Babbage, in the 19th century, designed such machines. Uh, they weren't built until the 1990s, actually, but he designed them in the 19th century. They were inspired by the Jacquard loom and mathematical logic. He designed the difference engine and the analytical engine, and these were, these were theoretical machines that were designed with specific mechanisms and documented as such. And as I said, they were finally built, or at least the analytical engine was finally built in the 1990s. Ada Lovelace, also in the 19th century, is someone that is very, very important in our field. She's the daughter, she was the daughter, or is the daughter, of Lord Byron, a poet and Lady Byron, a mathematician. And she's considered the first programmer. She is someone who designed the first algorithms 
for the analytical engine. Going, jumping forward to the 20th century, Alan Turing is a very significant person in our field. He was a mathematician and an engineer and a biologist. Uh, he did seminal work in theoretical computer science, particularly defining the field of computational complexity, which gives an understanding of what the limitations are of automated computation. He's also famous for inventing, or at least building, the bomb, and that's with an E, uh, which is a machine to perform statistical cryptanalysis used to break codes during World War II. After World War II, computing became an industry. In 1947, the Association for Computing Machinery was, was founded, and this year is its 75th anniversary. It presents the Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize in Computing. So let's talk about UCSC and computing at UCSC. 1967, so two years after the founding of, of UCSC, com the Computer and Information Science Board of Study was formed with seven faculty members. I'll note that this was one year before computer science was founded at Berkeley. This department also was in some sense the, uh, the stem or the stem cell of the Baskin School of Engineering. And 30 years later, in 1997, the school was formed and it joined three other professional schools of engineering in the UC system. So UCSB, UCLA, UCSD, and UC Santa Cruz are the four. And this year is the 25th anniversary of uh, the School of Engineering and now represents a quarter of the undergraduates on campus, more than a third of the graduate students. And in terms of computing, one in six students on campus are majoring in a computing program. So what does this have to do with tonight's speaker? And I'm sure tonight's speaker is wondering the same thing. <laughs> Fokian Koleitis is a trained mathematician. His work was in database, or is in, has may, mainly been in database management systems. And database management systems are really a prime example in our discipline of the collaboration between theory and practice. And again, I'll come back to that. Fokian has done fundamental, time-tested, and highly honored results in the use of logic in the design of database systems. Database systems are a very, very practical tool at the heart of most software that's running today. In 1978, Fokian earned a PhD in mathematics from UCLA. In 1988, he joined UC Santa Cruz and became an assistant professor of computer science. In 2012, Fukian was named a distinguished professor. And in 2020, Fukian um, became emeritus and an emeritus distinguished professor. Fukian served as chair of the department twice, um, 1997 to 2001, and then again in 2014 to 2015. In between, Fukian built a research career at IBM. And IBM, of course, is one of the main industry companies, leaders of the industry uh, in, formation, in the formation years of the industry of, of computing. And what, again, we see is actually that Fokian represents this combination of theory and practice of the mathematical and the electronic. Fokian is a fellow of the ACM and the AAAS, and has three IBM Innovation Awards. I think what's really remarkable about Fokian and his role in our department has been 
to be able to span these disciplines, to be able to bring together the different and disparate areas of computing as it's developed and keep it a coherent and um, coherent discipline with a very, very purposeful agenda. I have to give a, a small fun fact about Fokian. This one, I think, has been off repeated. Uh, he has a collection of around 200 fountain pens, uh, the most precious being his father's Parker 51. So as you heard, Fokian will be discussing computational social science, which applies an algorithmic lens to collective decision making. And it's my distinct honor and pleasure to call Fokian to the to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eli. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Wool, for this very kind introduction. I want to thank the Emeriti Association. It's a tremendous honor, and I'm delighted to be here. And thank you all for being here. And before I start, let me say what a difference a year makes. Uh, I was here a little over a year ago. And uh, the reason I was here was to get my second dose of the Moderna vaccine. And uh, some of you may have been here at around the same time. So this is truly a, a multi-purpose space. <laughs> Tonight is used for a different occasion, but I'm grateful that I could be there. And uh, yes, I had a teaser that said, uh, the earth is not flat and vaccines work. And, Thank God vaccines work indeed. All right, let's go now back to the topic of tonight's uh, lecture. Uh, I should say that, uh, as Dean Wolf said, I, I work mostly on applications of logic to computer science, and in particular, logic and databases. I'm a relative newcomer to computational social choice. I had a, an acquaintance, nodding acquaintance with the area until about 2015 when I started looking more deeply into the area. I published my first paper in the area uh, towards the end of 2017. And since that time, this area has grown on me. I've become very fond of it. And now, in retirement, has become a big part of my intellectual life. So I would like to share with you some of the excitement uh, and tell you something about this area. The talk comes into three parts. The first part will be a general introduction to social choice theory, no computation involved. And then we will focus on a class of voting methods known as positional scoring rules and how we determine the winners uh, with respect to these positional scoring rules. Then we will introduce the notion of incompleteness uh, in social choice and discuss a variation of winners in the presence of incomplete information known as necessary winners and possible winners. Once we do this, we'll be ready to make the passage to computational social choice. But for this, I will need to provide a mini tutorial on computational complexity, and I'm glad that uh, Dean Wolf touched on computational complexity briefly. And then we will put the two together and discuss earlier work on the complexity of necessary winners and of possible winners. That's the second part. The last part will be a little bit of my own work on a new formalism that tries to create bridges between computational social choice and databases. And that's the notion of election databases. And then uh, what is the meaning of queries in this context and the computational complexity of queries. So what is social choice theory? Here is a succinct definition from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Social choice theory is the study of collective decision processes and procedures. But perhaps to get a better feeling of social choice theory, you have to look at some of the activities that take place in social choice theory. Uh, the foremost consideration is you have a society and the members of the society vote. How can the society aggregate these votes and arrive at a collective output, at a societal output. Uh, we do this using different voting methods. So what are the properties of the different voting, voting methods that we have? And another theme that has uh, occupied uh, the modern era of uh, social choice theory is 
when is non-dictatorial aggregation possible? Where by non-dictatorial aggregation, we, don't, we mean that when is it the case that no single individual in the society can impose their preferences? So the societal output is exactly what this individual dictated. Let me tell you a few things about the history of social choice theory by looking at six individuals. The first three individuals lived centuries ago. Perhaps the first is Ramon Lull, uh, who lived in the 13th century. He was a, a Catalan. Uh, he was a poet, a writer, a theologian, a logician, a mathematician, and some people say an early computer scientist. But he was also a very religious man, devoted deeply to the Catholic Church. And uh, some 30 years ago, among his other writings, they discovered a manuscript in which it turns out that Ramon Lull wrote a monograph on our selections, the art of the elections. And he proposed a voting system which today is known as pairwise majority voting. I won't tell you what it is exactly, but you may wonder why, how come this religious man wrote a treatise, a monograph on elections. The answer is it had to do with religion. And what it had to do with was the election of abbots and abbesses in monasteries. Before his time, this election has to uh, be arrived at through consensus. But the monks and the nuns were disagreeing uh, who should be the next abbot or the next abbess, and there was deadlock. So he stepped in and he proposed this pairwise majority voting. Uh, his work passed obviously unnoticed, and typically the names that you hear about uh, social choice theory, early history, are Borda and Condorcet. They are both friends, as the names suggest. They lived around the same time in the 18th century. Borda was a naval officer, a mathematician, a physicist, an engineer, a brilliant person, and proposed a ranked preferential voting system, which I will get to discuss later on, known as the board account. And this was used for about two decades to elect members in the French Academy. In fact, he was an academician himself. His system was dropped when Napoleon took over the Academy and imposed his own will. A contemporary of Borda was Marquis de Condorcet, uh, who was a mathematician, a philosopher, and a very progressive person. He advocated uh, education for women at the time that women were not getting any advanced education. He disagreed violently with uh, Borda about the, what is the right voting method to use, and he proposed his own version, which turned out to be very close to what Ramon Lull had proposed 500 years before, except he didn't know about it. And then he discovered something which is used today and talked about called the Condorcet Paradox. If there are questions to the end about this, I'm happy to answer them, but I'm not going to go into this now. Fast forward to the 20th century and 21st century. Uh, from the pantheon that we have, I picked up three names. Uh, the first and more foremost is Ken Arrow, uh, who in 1950 completed a brilliant thesis at Columbia University. And uh, he single-handedly defined the new era of social choice theory. Kenneth Arrow did three things in his thesis that were quite remarkable for a young person at that time. First, instead of looking at the individual voting systems, which is what Lull and Borda and Condorcet had done, he abstracted and started studying voting methods as objects of study in their own right. And how did he do that? He used the axiomatic method, the same way that Euclid used axioms to study Euclidean geometry, plane geometry. And then he put this together and proved what is known as the impossibility theorem, which is a stunning result. Uh, roughly speaking, it says that if you have a voting method that satisfies three or four very innocent looking conditions, then this voting method must be a dictatorship. There is someone 
in the society who imposes their will to the society. This is a pessimistic result. It tells you in some sense, if you want to have the desired properties, your only choice is to have a dictator. And much of the work since that time has gone into finding ways to overcome uh, this pessimism. Uh, of course, you have to relax one of the conditions. And what conditions should you relax? Aro published his thesis as a monograph in 1951, 1952. And at that time, Amartya Sen, who, by the way, is familiar to this campus. Last March, he gave the Mitra lecture through a webinar. I don't know if some of you attended. I did. Uh, Amartya Sen was a young undergraduate in Calcutta. And through serendipity, got hold of a copy of the book of Aro. And he decided that that's what he wants to study. He went to Cambridge to study economics, to do PhD in economics. He did it in social choice theory. And in 1970, he wrote his own masterpiece, a, a book called Collective Choice and Social Welfare. Uh, Kenneth Aro spent his academic life between Harvard and Stanford. Amartya Sen, who's alive and well, has spent his academic life between Cambridge and Harvard. And now comes Eric Maskin, uh, who is the younger of the three, as you can tell. He is a student of Kenneth Harrow, and he has spent his academic life between Harvard and the Institute for Advanced Study. And their lives are intertwined because Maskin and Sen have co-taught courses at Harvard on social choice theory, and they are, in some sense, public intellectuals in the best sense of the word, uh, because they write, they've written a lot of articles about the problems with the electoral system in the United States and what is the right voting system and so on and so forth. Eric Maskin has also become known for introducing something called mechanism design, who is often referred to as the engineering of social choice theory. And these individuals share something else. All three of them are Nobel laureates in economics. And now notice that Maskin is the student of Kenneth Arrow. So Arrow had one student who was a Nobel laureate. Actually, he has five. It's a very humbling thing to think about it. I mean, so far he has five. Maybe more will come because he has more students. OK, so that's the brief history of uh, social choice theory. Let me quickly give you a high level view of computational social choice, which is the topic of this lecture. Uh, it is simply the study of algorithmic aspects of social choice theory. And as such, is a meeting point of computer science, economics, and social welfare. Let's look at some of the problems or some of the themes in computational social choice. If we have a complicated voting system, how difficult uh, is to determine the winners. What are the algorithmic methods for determining the winners? Another theme, quite important, is it how easy or difficult is it to manipulate an electoral system? By now, we know that essentially all electoral systems, all voting methods, are subject to manipulation. The question is how easy or difficult it is. And for the computer scientists in the room, this is a little bit like cryptography. We usually stay away from computational hardness, except for cryptography, where we like computational hardness. The same thing happens here. If a system is difficult to manipulate, the system is more tamper-proof. That's the idea. And the topic of this discussion we have today is how do we cope with uncertainty uh, or actually incomplete information in voter preference. Uh, computational social choice is a new field. It has been developing for the last 20, 25 years. If you want to learn more about it, I've been learning about it through this handbook of computational social choice, 500 uh, pages plus compendium, 10 chapters, 20 chapters or so, and um, widely available. Uh, it's an excellent, an, excellent, an excellent source. So let's talk about elections. This is a totally hypothetical scenario. Uh, so let's say. We have candidates. In this case, we have four candidates. And we have voters. We have many voters, but I could only fit three in the slide. The voting model we have is that we require that every voter ranks the candidates for the most preferred to the least preferred. And the direction of the arrow 
indicates the most preferred to the least preferred. So the green voter prefers Trump to Cruz and Cruz to Sanders and Sanders to Clinton. While the blue voter prefers Sanders to Clinton and Clinton to Trump and Trump to um, Cruz. So this is the model. This is the scenario that we have. So more formally, uh, we have candidates and voters, and every voter casts a ballot, and the ballot is a complete ranking. The mathematical concept that captures this complete ranking is a linear order. I'm not going to bother to define it. I think the intuition of a complete ranking suffices. So here is a voter, and this is the ranking of the candidates. The candidate C5, CI1, is, is, is preferred to CI2, and so on and so forth. Now, every voter casts such a preference, such a complete ranking. So when we take them all together, we have the profile of the society. We call this a preference profile. So this is a collection of such complete rankings, a vector of complete rankings. And then here comes the notion of a voting rule. A voting rule is a mechanism that takes as input such a profile, such a list of preferences from all the voters, and produces a set of winners. Uh, here we will offer the possibility that we have ties, so we may have more than one winner. There is, of course, a parallel discussion when you want to have a unique winner. I will leave it for another time, but it's very similar. The analysis is very similar. So the voting rule takes as input such a list of complete rankings and produces a set of winners. The main example that will keep us busy tonight, which is not an example, but a family of examples, uh, is the voting system known as positional scoring rules. It's a family of voting systems. What's the idea here? That with every position in the ranking, you have associated a score. And the score is a whole number, 3, 5, 25. So every voter gives a candidate a score according to the ranking that they had. And then what we do, we add the scores of the candidates, and then the winner or winners are the ones that have a maximum score. I put here winners because we may have ties. Okay. Let's look at some concrete cases of positional scoring rules. Arguably, the most well-known is plurality. Plurality is modeled by this scoring vector. The top choice gets a score of one, and everybody else gets a score of zero. That's exactly what happens when we go and cast a vote for one person. It's captured by this rule. So this is widely used, for instance, in elections in the Senate, in elections in the House, although things are changing now. Look what's happening in Alaska. They are changing the system to something different. But it's a very, very widely used system, plurality. Now, sometimes, especially in municipal elections or Board of Education or Board of Supervisors, uh, you have to vote for two, or you have to vote for three. This is captured by the rule known as K approval, where K is a positive integer, like two, three, four, five, etc., bigger than one. So the top K, each of them gets a one, and everybody else gets a zero. So two approval is when you vote for two, and everybody else gets zero. Plurality has a dual rule called veto, where you give everybody one except for your least preferred who gets a zero. So it's like voting against the candidate. And there is a variation of K approval, a dual version of K approval, which is called K veto, where you give everybody one except for your last K choices, the last two choices, if it is two, two veto, the last three choices, if it's three veto. Finally, let me introduce the board account. Remember, we talked about board before and how this rule was used in the French Academy to elect academicians. If you have M candidates, your top candidate gets M minus 1. Your second gets M minus 2. The one before last gets 1, and the last one gets 0. The idea is that these numbers, these scores, represent the number of candidates ranked below you. That's what it is. 
and then the scores are added. So that's the border count. Notice it has a very different character. The scores look very different than plurality, uh, veto, etc. So that's the border count. And in fact, many academic departments use the border count. When I came to U.S. Santa Cruz, I had never heard about the border count before. But my colleague David Hemmel, one time, I don't know if Charlie remembers that, insisted that we vote for faculty candidates using the board account. So we had 10, 12 members in the department. We have five candidates we had to use. <laughs> this rule, it worked quite well. So, all right, time for a quiz. Every lecture should have a quiz, right? That's what we tell our students. We have four voters, V1, V2, V3, and V4. And we have three candidates, A, B, and C. This is the ranking. V1 ranks A above C and C above B. V2 does something different. V3 does exactly what V1 did. V4 does also something different. So now I ask you, who wins? OK, now you, I think we will all agree that B should not win, right? Because B has been put last in three out of the four voters. So B should not win. But should A win? Should C win? This is what teachers like to say, there are no wrong answers. Why there are no wrong answers? Because it depends on the rule. I didn't tell you what the rule is. Depends on the rule. So let me illustrate why it depends on the rule. Uh, if we use plurality, I claim that A wins. If we use veto, C wins. If we use border, both A and C win. And the calculation is very easy. For example, in plurality, A gets a score of two, B and C get a score of one. In veto, C is never at the end. So C will end up with score four because he's never at the end. The others will get a lower score because they've been at least one or, or more times at the end. What happens with border? A and a C tie, let's look at the score of A. A gets two points from V1, two points from V3, that's four, and then gets one point from V4, being in the second position, that's five. And you can do the same calculation. So as you see, the rule you choose has tremendous impact. The voters voted the same way, but depending on the rule, we had different outcomes. We should think about uh, elections as our primary example, and my running exam will be a fictitious election. But this model applies to many different cir circumstances. The candidates do not have to be individuals, uh, people. They can be issues. Should we, bridge, should we build a bridge? or put the money to build a school or put a theater. And you may have a ranked choice. So it's, it's very much used in allocation of resources and so on and so forth. Uh, here is a very different example. There is a festival in Europe known as Eurovision where every year every country sends a song and there is a competition and the judges who are from each country uh, give scores to the songs. They have a very strange scoring vector. The top gets 12, the second gets 10, it goes down to zero, and everybody else gets zero. So here the candidates are the songs, and the voters are the judges. And you can see the results from the 2021 Eurovision. 2022 is supposed to take place next month. Italy adds the France, and the UK did horribly. No one put, this means no one put it in the top 10. That's what it means. Okay. So very different rule. All right? For those of you into fast cars, I'm, I'm with a slow car. I came with the Volvo 2005. Uh, there is the Formula One championship. The Formula One championship is a sequence of races between 21 to 23 races a year. They are called the Grand Prix. And they have a strange scoring vector also, 25, 18, 15, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, 1, 0. So here the candidates are the drivers and the voters are the races. So you can let, let our imagination loose and consider many scenarios where actually elections, decisions are made based on these positional scoring rules. So let me sum up what I have said so far. 
We are talking about positional scoring rules. We have candidates and voters. We have the notion of a preference profile, which is a sequence of complete rankings, one for every voter. The positional scoring rule is a mechanism for selecting winners. We, are, we associate a score with every position. We add the scores, and we determine the winners. Now, this assumed a rather ideal situation, namely that every voter was able to rank all the candidates in a complete ranking. But reality is a little different, of course. Uh, some voters may be unable to provide a complete ranking. Why? The simplest reason is too many candidates. Just think if the election to recall Gavin Newsom and replace him, uh, we had to rank the 46 people that ran against him. Fortunately, you only had to vote for one, right? If, or, or, or for no one. Think of a poll, because everything I said applies to polls. During a poll before the election, maybe people have not spent enough time to evaluate the five candidates. Example, 2020 presidential election, in the Democratic primary, we had 16 candidates, governors, mayors, senators, etc. Uh, Congress, so maybe there's not time spent on learning about the candidates, even if you are very much interested in politics. So all you can provide is partial comparison. Now comes a mathematical question. What is the model of incompleteness we're going to use here? And the model is very naturally partial rankings which in mathematics and computer science in a discrete math course, we call them partial orders. Uh, this example illustrates what a partial order is. Ted Cruz, uh, this, the, the, the green voter, prefers Cruz to Clinton, prefers Cruz to Trump, prefers Sanders to Clinton, and prefers Sanders to Trump, but expresses no preference between Cruz and Sanders and no preference between Clinton and Trump. So this is modeled by writing down the preferences. Cruz prefer to Clinton, Cruz prefer to Trump, Sanders prefer to Clinton, Sanders prefer to Trump. So this is an example of a partial order or intuitively a partial ranking. So now we have the scenario where every voter casts a partial ranking. We allow this possibility. Of course, a voter may have full information about the candidates and may provide a complete ranking, that's fine. A complete ranking is a special case of a partial ranking, but we allow for the possibility to have partial rankings which are not complete rankings. Now imagine such a partial ranking. If you have the partial ranking, you can think of complete rankings that are compatible with it. So they are complete rankings, but they agree with the partial ranking. This is called the completion of a partial ranking. So it's a complete ranking that extends the partial ranking. It's compatible with it. And if you had a collection of partial rankings cast by every voter, that's a partial preference profile, then you can consider the completion, or a completion, because there are many completions of a partial preference. You complete each of the partial rankings that the voters cast. So we can go from partial profiles to total profiles, to completions, to, to, to profiles as we discussed them before. Let me uh, illustrate with an example and also sensitize you to the fact that the problem with the completion is that we can have lots of completions. And that will get us to the computational aspects and the problems. So we go back to our green voter. This is the partial ranking of the green voter. Here are some completions. Sanders, Cruz, Clinton, Trump. This is entirely consistent because Cruz is preferred to Clinton. Cruz is preferred to Clinton. Uh, Cruz is preferred to Trump. Cruz is preferred to Trump. So this is a completion, but that's not the only one. This is another completion. And here is another completion. These are all compatible with the partial ranking. And there is a fourth one that I didn't have space to put in the slide, if you think about it. And here, 
we see what happens when we take the society as a whole. The society has just three voters, because that's all we can fit in the slide. Uh, this is one completion of this partial ranking. This is, this is uh, the red voter has this partial ranking. That's one completion. And this voter, all that, all that this voter says, I prefer Trump uh, to, to Sanders. And that's one completion. So what the blue, the, the, the linear rankings together give us a completion of the partial ranking, uh, of the partial rankings that we had before. So this is our setting. We have partial rankings. We think of their completions. So now, suppose the voters have cast these partial rankings, and the question arises, who wins? We can't make sense of this yet. I mean, because the, 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 the rules that we saw before, the position of scoring rules, required complete rankings. Here we have a profile consisting of partial rankings. So people puzzled about this for a while. And in 2005, Konzak and Lang wrote a very influential paper. And they introduced the notions of necessary winner and partial winner. And this will be very fundamental notions for what's going to follow. Who is a necessary winner? A necessary winner is a winner who wins in every completion. No matter how we extend this preference of the society, this person is guaranteed to be a winner. A possible winner is a candidate for whom there exists one completion in which he's the winner. This notion, if you think about it, is quite, these notions are quite attractive. Uh, the way some of us understand these notions is through the metaphor of possible worlds. And let me try to explain this metaphor. A partial ranking, a collection of partial rankings, a partial profile, can be thought of as a compact representation of many different realities. Its reality is a completion. Its reality is a possible world. So the necessary winners are the ones that win in every possible world, while the possible winners are the ones who win in some possible world. And this is a very useful metaphor to think that we have this compact description of some reality. It's partial description, but it represents different completed realities. And then you try to study the different completed realities by looking at this compact representation that we have. So, once you have this notion, this question makes a lot of sense. So in this setting, where we have only partial preferences cast by the voters, when you ask, can Clinton win, what does it mean? This is a question in English. We have now a formal counterpart. It means Clinton is a possible winner. Is Clinton a possible winner? Is there a completion of this in which, winner, in which Clinton is a winner? And God forbid, will Trump always win? Uh, what does it mean? It means, is it the case that no matter what completion we take, Trump will win? So we can formalize these modalities. Can Clinton will? Will Trump always win through the notion of possible winner and necessary winner that Konzak and Lang gave us in 2005? So now, with this, we are ready to talk about the algorithmic problems. Shelley Arrington asked me that we have algorithms. I told you they come towards the end, <laughs> but they do come. So let's fix a positional scoring rule. So this is a family of algorithmic problems, one for every positional scoring rule of which we saw there is an abundance of them, right? We saw several examples. The necessary winner problem says the following. I give you as input a partial preference profile, partial rankings of by the voters, and the candidate. And I ask you, is this candidate a necessary winner? The possible winner problem asks, given a partial preference profile and the candidate, is he a possible winner? Is there a completion in which he is a winner? And the question is, can we solve these problems? Do we have good algorithms? Now, of course, we have an algorithm for this problem. Because we're in a finite situation, so we can examine all the completions one by one by one by one, and in each case, find the winner. 
and see if our candidate is always among the winners or is not. But what I just described is what we call exhaustive search. We search through all these possible wells, and there is a problem. There are too many possible wells. In general, the exponentiality monsters shows up its ugly head. Exhaustive search can be prohibitively expensive because a partial profile may have exponentially many completions. So now let me digress a little bit and, uh, and talk about uh, algorithms and computational complexity. Uh, what is computer science? I think, for me at least, the most succinct description of what computer science is is that computer science is the study of algorithms. With this lens, let's see what an algorithm is. An algorithm, as already Dean Wolf said, is a collection of unambiguous instructions for solving a problem. The problems we are trying to solve uh, have the following characteristic. Someone gives you an input, and you expect the algorithm to produce an output. Let's look at a simple example. A, a bunch of names are given, and you want to output the names in alphabetic order. A bunch of numbers are given, and you want to output them in increasing or decreasing order. These are sorting problems that we teach uh, in our freshman students. Uh, so th but that gives you an idea of the input-output behavior of an algorithm. We are interested in counting the number of steps that the algorithm takes in solving a problem. And that's the running time. So the running time of an algorithm is the maximum number f of n of steps that the algorithm takes on inputs of size n. So every input has a description. So we have a way to measure how many bits there are in the description. We look at all the inputs of the same size. We find the number of steps in each case, and we take the maximum of these. That's the running time of the algorithm. And computational complexity classifies problems according to the resources, and in particular, according to time. There is another resource space, and you can think of other resources, too, like energy. But let's look at just time. It classifies problems according to the resources, according to the resources time, for example, that the algorithm needs to solve them. And now comes a very important distinction that will keep us busy for the rest of the lecture, a notion, the notion of a problem being tractable as opposed to a problem being intractable. Intuitively, tractable means it can be solved by an algorithm whose running time is reasonable. And reasonably formalized with the notion the running time is bounded by a polynomial. What are polynomials? Are functions like this, 50 times n or 100 times n. This is a linear function. f of n equals 3n squared. f of n equals n cubed. You basically take your input and you raise it to a fixed power. That's what a polynomial is. So you are looking for algorithms whose running time is at most such a function. What if you don't have this behavior? Then your problem is called intractable. And so an intractable problem is a problem for which you have no algorithm whose running time is bounded by a polynomial. What are some such problems? For example, problems whose running time is at least exponential. Every algorithm will require running time at least exponential. Here is a graph that I borrowed from Wikipedia. Explains the role the difference between exponential and polynomial functions. The green line here is 2 to the x. So we take the input and uh, we raise it, to, uh, we take power 2 to, the, to this input. And every exponential function beats every polynomial uh, function eventually. So from a point on, the exponential takes over and takes off. So this is prohibitively expensive behavior if, if you have an algorithm who runs in exponential time. And for the past 50 years, the area of computational complexity has tried to make sense out of this problem. If I give you a computational problem, is it tractable or is it intractable? Do I have an algorithm that can solve it and the running time is reasonable, or are all algorithms for this problem having unreasonable 
uh, running time. And we have this division. The red area are the intractable problems, and the smaller area are the tractable problems. We've made a lot of progress. We know a lot of problems which are here. We know a lot of problems which are there. Unfortunately, we are also in a state of ignorance as regards the boundary. What separates the tractable from the intractable? However, the research in this area has brought into the picture a very important class of problems, which is really the center of attention in computational complexity. And this is the class of NP-complete problems. I won't give you the definition. I won't even try to, expect, to explain the name. NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. I'm going to not go to the details. But instead, I will try to give you a feeling about these problems. I'll try to give you a feeling by talking about their characteristics. Let's start with what we don't know about them. We don't know if they are tractable or intractable. It's a family of problems. We don't know if they are tractable or intractable. But we know they all behave the same. They have an all or nothing behavior. Either all of them are tractable or all of them are intractable. You can't split them. All of them are easy or all of them are hard. Think of it this way. Their existence is not an accident. They are ubiquitous. NP completeness is a pervasive phenomenon. They encountered in mathematics, in computer science, in computer engineering, in physics, in biology, in economics. Uh, of course, someone had to invent the first one, they discovered the first one, and Stephen Cook gets the credit for that. In 1971, that's 51 years ago, last year, the community celebrated the 50th anniversary of the publication of his seminal paper, introduced the notion of a com NP complete problem, and saw that such a problem exists. And this was a very simple problem from logic, about the simplest problem you can think from logic. You are given a Boolean formula. That's an expression that involves variables, conjunctions, disjunctions, and negations. And you ask, can I, can I set the variables to one? or zero so that the formula evaluates to true. This problem is the prototypical NP-complete problem, and Stephen Cook gets the credit for discovering it. Uh, by the way, uh, a rather sad story for UC Berkeley, since we've been on UC Berkeley before. Uh, he was a professor at Berkeley. He did not get tenure. Uh, he was coming up for tenure when his paper was published. He went to Toronto. He's one of the most distinguished computer scientists of all times. So Berkeley can make mistakes. So, let's look more at the NP-complete problems. So the central question in computational complexity, are NP-complete problems tractable or intractable? And here is what this question means. This is the block of NP-complete problems. We know that either all of them here or all of them go there, but we don't know which of the two happens. This question is known as the P versus NP problem P for polynomial time for the tractable. NP are these problems. We don't know if they go here or there. Uh, in 2000, the Clay Mathematics Institute in the UK put out a list of problems in mathematics and theoretical computer science, seven problems, uh, which they challenged the mathematicians and computer science to solve them. And these are called the millennium problems. And um, NP Versus P versus NP is one of them. Actually, the only problem for theoretic, from theoretical computer science. It carries a price of one million, so one can become rich and famous. If one solves it, I think one will become more famous than rich, but uh, that's, that's how it is. So what is the point of NP completeness? Uh, today, as we speak, people are still publishing papers showing that a new problem is NP complete. By now, most computer scientists believe, but we have no proof, that all these problems are intractable. But we don't know how to prove this. So we still try to prove that certain problems are NP-complete because we view this as evidence that the problem is intractable. And when one of these problems is shown to be intractable, then your new problem will also be intractable because they, they move as a block. Either all are intractable or all are tractable. The other reason for showing that the new problem is NP-complete is because they come in very different walks of scientific life. Maybe 
you come across a new problem in a different area that will give you some idea of how to solve it. I don't think this is going to happen this way, but who knows? We can never dismiss any possibilities. So this concludes the mini tutorial on computational complexity. We try to understand the boundary between tractability and intractability. We have this class of problems. We believe they're intractable. We don't know that for sure, but they all behave the same way. With this knowledge, let's go back to computational social choice and look at these problems. The necessary winner problem and the possible winner problem. Given a partial preference profile in the candidate, is the candidate the necessary winner? Is it the possible winner? So now we have these tools of complexity and we can ask ourselves, are they tractable or intractable? And we have an answer. And the answer came through intense work uh, between 2005 and 2012, there are several groups of people. These are the most important contributions. They collectively proved a very beautiful classification theorem that tells us everything we need to know about the necessary winners and the possible winners. The first is good news, positive news. The necessary winner problem is tractable. There is a polynomial time algorithm no matter what positional scoring rule you use. The possible winner problem exhibits a dichotomy. It is tractable only for plurality and veto. Remember the first two rules we studied. For all other rules, the problem is NP-complete, and therefore we believe it's intractable. But we have, they added to our knowledge of NB-complete problems all this family of problems, one for every positional scoring rule other than plurality and veto. For the computer scientists in the audience, the tractability of the possible winner problem for plurality and veto is a simple algorithm that uses max flow of the kind we teach in our graduate algorithms class. The necessary winner problem is tractable by a dynamic programming algorithm. These are not deep results. They are elegant, but not terribly deep. The deep result was the NP-completeness for everybody else, because there are infinitely many rules. So how do you deal with infinitely many rules? Well, the way we deal usually, we categorize these rules in finitely many blocks according to the characteristics, and then we attack each block separately. I like to think of this result as the price of incompleteness. Because we are dealing with incomplete information, because we have to reason about all these possible wells from our little representation of partial wells, we have to pay a price. And the price is the complexity goes up to NP-complete. That's how you should think of this. So that concludes the second part. And now I'm coming to the last part, uh, which is uh, a little bit of my own work. Uh, social choice, if, especially if it's about elections, doesn't take place in the vacuum. It takes place in a context. We have information about candidates. We know their age, their education, their net worth, the position on issues, more importantly, etc. We have information about voters when they do polls, for instance. Age, gender, education, occupation. And the voters may also have partial preference, as we saw. So the previous work on social choice did not take into account at all the context. And we wanted to do something about context. So uh, my colleagues and I, Benny Kimmelfeld, Julia Stojanovic, and Mohamed Tibi, embarked on a project to create ties between databases, because databases encode relational context, and computational social choice. These were our first two papers. Let me uh, acknowledge my collaborator. Benny Kimmelfeld is a professor at Technion in Israel. I've been collaborating with him since the time he was at IBM Almaden in 2008. Julia Stojanovic is a professor at New York University. And uh, Benny was collaborating with her on a different proje project. Julia is one of the leaders on algorithmic fairness and uh, bias, uh, algorithmic bias, and uh, we joined forces at some point, and then Mohamed Tibi, who's a student of Benny, joined us, so that's how these two papers came about, the first two papers that I mentioned. Now, before I go on, let's have a mini, mini, a nano-tutorial, if you will, on databases. 
Uh, what is a relational database? Intuitively, a relational database is a collection of tables. Except these tables, we give them names, and we give names to every column, and the, the columns are fixed. Uh, the content goes in the rows, so every row holds a record. So candidates, we have the name of the candidate, the party, the net worth, and the name of the spouse. And every row represents the information for every candidate. And then where the candidate was born, person born, and the voters, uh, voter age, you can imagine things like that. That's what a database is, a relational database. We have other types of databases, a collection of tables. What do we do with the database? How we interact with it as users? We write questions. These questions in database jargon are called queries. So a query is a question posed against the database. Is there a candidate born in New York City whose net worth is less than, uh, one, than 10 million? Okay. Uh, or give me all the candidates whose net worth is less than 1 million, and so on and so forth. And there are languages for writing these queries. The main language in the industry standard, which we teach in our undergraduate class, in fact, that was the last thing I did in the spring of 2020, teach the undergraduate database class before I retired. Uh, this is SQL, Structured Query Language. It's a very different language than, uh, let's say, Java or Python or something like that. It's a high-level declarative language where the user, instead of saying what the user wants to retrieve, uh, uh, the user says, excuse me, the user says what they want to retrieve as opposed to how to retrieve it. And there is this construct, that's the main uh, construct, select columns from a bunch of tables where the row satisfies certain conditions. So that's the main construct of SQL. So you know what a relational database is, and you know our goal was to bridge social choice with relational databases. So we came up with a notion of an election database. And an election database is a relational database augmented with partial preference of voters. So there are two ingredients. One is the standard relational database. We have information about uh, age, gender, education, net worth, information about voters, information about donors and funders, etc. But there is a second ingredient. And the second ingredient is a partial preference of voters. Because as we saw before, the voters may be undecided between candidates. So here is a picture. Uh, this part above this yellow uh, line, above these blue lines, is an election database. This is the standard good old database. And this is a table that incorporates preferences of voters. This election database now stands for a whole bunch of completed databases. The completions, they have all the same, all, they all have the same relational part, but they differ in the ways we have completed the partial preferences. So every completion of this gives rise to a different completed election database. That's the model. So as I said, it takes the previous model of elections with partial preferences and adds the relational context. And then the two questions are, what is the semantics? What does it mean to ask a query now against such a situation? And how difficult it is to get answers? Uh, what questions do I have in mind? Does a Republican always win? Which cities are guaranteed to have winners from? Is there a winner of net worth less than a million? Are there two winners who are related? They are cousins. Uh, notice I here quietly entered some logical formulas uh, just to show that these queries, when you write them in logic, they have a very similar syntactic structure. Even if you don't know what this means, you recognize the similarity in syntax. This exists x is the existential quantifier. Is there an x? Is there an x? So that x is a winner, this is the conjunction, and the party of x is r. Is there a Republican? Uh, is there a winner who lives in, uh, in the city uh, uh, Y? Is there a winner who lives in the city X? Is there a winner and a value of uh, his or her net worth uh, whose net worth is less than uh, one million? 
are there are two winners who are cousins. So these are the type of queries we have in mind. We have a language for this, but I think that should suffice. So now we generalize the notion of necessary and possible winners to necessary and possible answers. How does it work? Well, you have this database that's an election database that has a relational part in these partial rankings. This stands for, represents a whole bunch of completed databases. In each such completed database, you can ask the, query, you can ask the question and you get the answers. And then you look at the answers that appear in all these answers. This is the intersection, and that's the necessary answers. So a necessary answer is a tuple that belongs to the answer for every completion, while a possible answer is a tuple that belongs in at least one completion. So this is the semantics. Again, the metaphor of the possible wells works very well here. It's such completed database, you only complete the partial rankings, is a database on which you can directly evaluate the query. And then you collect the answers by aggregating them in the case of necessary through the intersection, in the case of the possible through the union. Now with this, uh, we can formalize these questions in English. So when we ask, does the Republican always win? This question in English is formalized by saying, I'm asking for the necessary answers to this query. Is there a winner whose party is the Republican Party? I'm asking, is it true that in every completion this will happen? Notice that the semantics is very nuanced. The question, does a Republican win, is different. Is there a Republican who is a necessary winner? Let me explain this. It is conceivable that you don't have the same Republican winning every time. But every time a Republican wins. Sometimes Cruz wins, sometimes Trump wins. So it is conceivable that the necessary answer to this query is yes. There is always a Republican, but not the same Republican. Okay? Which cities are guaranteed to have winners from? Again, the expression in English implies that you are asking here for the necessary answers. On the other hand, if you say, is there a winner of net worth less than a million, you can give it either necessary semantics or possible semantics. Is it always the case in every completion we have a winner of worth less than a million? Or you can say possible. Is, is there some completion in which there is a winner whose net worth is less than a million? Are there two winners who are cousins? Again, you can view this as a necessary semantics or possible semantics depending on your choice. Okay, so here the English doesn't tell us we have to decide or have to modify the question to say which of the two. Now we come and ask what are the algorithmic problems? For the database people in the audience, this is about data complexity, not combined complexity. We're going to fix the query and we're going to fix the voting rule. So we have for every query and for every voting rule, we have a computational problem. And the problem is, I give you an election database and the tuple, and I ask you, what is the, I ask you, is it necessary or possible? And the output is yes or no. So every query and every fixed voting rule gives rise, in fact, to two algorithm problems, the necessary answers problem and the possible answers problem. How difficult are these problems? So, here is the answer to this, but to uh, relate to the answer, let me remind you that what we saw in the classification theorem uh, some time ago was that as regards the necessary winners, they are always computable in polynomial time. So the necessary winner problem is tractable. But that was only, we're asking only for one winner. Our main result at a high level, I can't get to the details, they're quite technical, is that we have a broad collection of queries of the type that I showed you before, for which we have a complete classification of the complexity. And this is depending on the query and the positional scoring rule. Now we have this query as a parameter, so we need to take into account the shape and form and the structural properties of the query. Depending on the query and the positional scoring rule, 
the problem can be tractable or it can be incomplete. What is the collection of queries studied? Technically speaking, we looked at the select project join queries augmented with winner atoms and no repeated relations from the relational database. Uh, this is again addressed only to the people who know what these things mean. I will not try to explain it. Instead of trying to explain uh, the technical terms behind the theorem, I will illustrate it with some examples. Uh, let's take the simplest query that you can imagine that goes beyond asking is X a winner. Let's, this is the winner, the query asks, is there a winner who comes from a relation R? Is there a winner who's a Republican? Well, the result that we have implies that the necessary answers for this query is a tractable problem for the plurality and the veto rule. But if you take any other rule, the problem is NP complete. This is a big difference from what we had about the necessary winners. The necessary winners was always tractable. Now we go to this richer class of queries, and we have already a dichotomy in this behavior. And things get worse if you look at the question, are there two winners who are cousins? This problem is NP complete and hence intractable for every positional scoring rule, for every positional scoring rule. Again, we had to do something analogous to what they did in the classification theorem. We had to group things uh, in different groups, but only now we had to also to account for the query. Uh, so here is, here is what it says for the various rules. I'm almost at the end uh, here, uh, just il illustrating the result. So the necessary winners of this query for plurality and veto are tractable, but for everything else, like two approval, three veto, border, Eurovision, whatever else you want to fit here, is NP complete. And if you go to the query and there are two winners who are related, then everything becomes intractable. And uh, here is again the difference between necessary winners and necessary answers. We have enriched the language. We, we can ask more sophisticated questions. It comes at a price. We lose tractability, uh, except for the case of simple queries like that, for plurality and veto. So let me summarize. Uh, we have seen a new framework that augments computational social choice with relational database context. And as such, is an area of interdisciplinary research. We have gone from necessary and possible winners to necessary and possible answers. The take home message is that we saw before incompleteness makes a difference. Here, context makes a difference, even for plurality and veto. Uh, what are we working now on? Uh, we are looking at the richer analysis and modeling. The language we have so far uses one election at a time, but you can ask queries that involve different elections, necessary answers involving different questions, uh, or different voting rules. As we saw, different voting rules may produce different winners. Uh, we are also looking at integrity constraints, uh, which is you may, you may want to have some restrictions uh, in, the, in, the, in the election as to how many candidates from a particular group have to be elected and so on. And then there is another area which is even uh, studied now extensively, approval voting, where you try to elect committees. And that's also been worked out by many different groups. We want to take approval voting in that relational context. Uh, there have been some other recent work that I would like to acknowledge by title at least with my former student, Vishal Chakraborty, uh, who's now at Irvine. We published a paper in the AMAS conference. That's the main conference for computational social choice. Uh, we did the dichotomy theorem, the classification theorem, but for a very restricted type of partial uh, rankings, which are called partial chains. A partial chain is a partial ranking, which is a complete ranking on a subset of the candidates. These are exactly the, the situation when you, there are so many Netflix movies, but we can only watch a subset. 
Okay, and then you have a complete ranking for those, and you want to reason about all the movies from these complete rankings. We saw that the same classification holds. Then uh, Benny Kimmelfeld, Julia, and I got our students together to collaborate and interact and uh, implement and did a whole bunch of experiments on heuristics. Because a, because a problem is NP-complete, that doesn't mean you should not try to solve it. But you can't solve it exactly. So we have some heuristics for this. And in a totally different direction, I had a very productive collaboration with my colleagues at the University of Athens, Lefteris Kirousis and John Liviaratos. And uh, we looked on the computational complexity of non-dictatorial aggregation. I mentioned before, there is a large body of work that tries to make to bypass the optimism, to overcome rather the, opti the pessimism of Arrow's impossibility theorem. And one of the ways is to relax uh, the assumption that every ranking is possible. And when this happens, you get into something called possibility domains. And we looked at how difficult it is to detect that you can avoid dictatorial aggregation. And we had a paper in the Journal of AI Research last, uh, last year. Uh, so I will. Um, I will stop here, thank you for your attention, and leave you with this quote by none other than Amartya Sen, imparting education not only enlightens the receiver, but also broadens the giver, the teachers, the parents, and the friends. Thank you very much. Very fascinating um, things in your talk. Thank you. Um, there are a couple questions I have. One is the general question about how does the possibility of doing sampling theory rather than an exact interpretation of the um, your, the last part where you were talking about the NP versus the uh, P problems, yeah, yeah. and it seems like elections are determined by basically a prob probability. Somebody has more votes in a kind of a broad range to someone less. And so I'm just curious whether that sort of a yes. um, question can, can be used. Yes. Uh, the second question is, you, I'm curious about how unique the completeness of a partial preference is. You seem to indicate later in your talk that there was some um, ambiguity in, in how you do the completion. And I'm, I'm just curious about how, how unique that problem All is. Right. And then I'm also curious about the impossibility theorem, uh, theory, uh, law, or whatever postulate uh, that has more recently been proposed. Let, let me try to make sure I can follow all the questions. There is a body of work where you model uncertain, you model incompleteness through uncertainty. And that I have not covered that, and I have not worked on that. But there is a way to make sense uh, out of um, incomplete information through uncertainty and, and, pro and probabilities. It's a, this, there is a body of work there. I, I simply have not worked on that. The other, I'm not sure, the second question, no, a, a, a partial ranking may have, in general, has exponentially many completions. We cannot avoid that. And that's, that's, that's what accounts. That's the root cause of the NP-completeness phenomenon. That uh, basically, you, can, you have to deal with all these uh, exponentially many completions. And uh, sometimes there are ways to bypass it. But in general, as, as you saw from the results, you cannot. You can only bypass it in these cases, in the case of the possible winner problem, only for plurality and veto. You go to two approval, and the problem be becomes hard. So uh, the number of completions um, is, is important. Uh, the, there is, however, you are, there's something deeper in what you are asking and that I'm trying to answer. Some of the proofs of NP-completeness for these problems show that it's enough to have only a tiny amount of incompleteness in every voter. Like they, 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 they can rank everybody but four. But the problem is that you have many voters. So even if you get, then you get exponential explosion from this. Because if, every, if for every voter we have two completions, then we have two to the end completions in total. So that's where you get again Exponentiality. Exponentiality comes from the number of voters and from the number of completions of its ranking. The third question. The third question was the 
possibility. Yes. Uh, here on the, the, I, the Adams. Um, first, I forgot my name. Addo. Kenneth Addo, yes. What it, what it says? What basically is this? Oh, okay, okay. So, let me try to uh, explain it as best as I can. Uh, so the impossibility theorem imagines a voting system, a voting method, a voting rule, as I described here, uh, which satisfies certain properties. The first property is the so-called universal domain, unrestricted domain. It means that if I have the candidates, every voter can rank them in any possible way. You don't restrict the preferences that the voter can choose. Anything goes. That's an unrestricted domain. The second is a rationality condition. It says that if you have a candidate and every voter ranks this candidate first, then the society should rank this voter first. So then if you have such unanimity among the voters, uh, then these are uncontroversial to a certain extent. The third one is the one that gives the, <laughs> the, 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 the power to prove the impossibility theorem. And this is called uh, independent of irrelevant alternatives. And goes by the acronym IIA. Uh, in the simplest form, which I have learned through a lecture by Eric Maskin, that's not how Arrow formulated, is the following thing. Suppose you have an election and the candidate wins. Again, the voters provided complete rankings. Now, take the same election, except that one of the non-winners is dropped. So people rank exactly the same, but there is a missing guy. This candidate is gone. Then the previous winner should still be a winner. That's the independence of irrelevant alternatives. But notice that this, as Eric Maskin very eloquently says, this means, this, this property means there are no spoilers. And if you think of the 2000 election in Florida, there was a spoiler. The spoiler was Ralph Nader. Okay, if Bush won by 600 votes, never mind the charts, I'm talking about ab absolute numbers in votes. He won by a few hundred votes, but if Nader was not there, Chances are that Gore would have won by 100,000 votes. So this means that the plurality violates this independence of irrelevant alternatives, which also means that plurality supports spoilers. Uh, so Arrow's theorem says if you have a voting system where every voter can cast anything the voter wants, it's a preference, where this Pareto optimize, this Pareto is unanimity, if everybody rank someone first, this has to be ranked first, and also there are no spoilers, independence of Iran, then the system must be dictatorship. That's what his theorem says. Okay, so if you want to avoid dictatorship, you must give up on other three conditions. So people have, uh, people have modified IIA conditions. Uh, the work I mentioned at the end relaxes the assumption of the unrestricted domain. You disallow some preferences and so on. So that's the impossibility. Stunning result. I mean, this, he did in his thesis. <laughs> Any further questions? Yeah. So is the logic of that that uh, the preferential voting is inherently um, superior to plurality? Ah, OK. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Uh, so. Yes, it, 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 is, it is not, but not for this reason. Not for this reason. Uh, you still can't avoid the, uh, you still have, it's, it's better because it, it's supposed to be more representative, more voices are heard. I mean, the, we are now witnessing the ranked choice, introduction of uh, 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 ranked choice uh, elections. In fact, today, I, just in the afternoon, I got uh, a message from the San Jose Mercury News that the San Jose City Council rejected a uh, ranked choice for the voters. Oh, okay. It rejected a ranked choice uh, for the voters, the, the, the San Jose City Council, while 
now there is a tendency to go to the rank uh, based. Uh, the, shall I explain what rank based voting is? OK. So it is the system that was used in the New York election uh, last year, and it's going to be used in Alaska, in the one Alaska congressional seat on which <laughs> Sarah Palin is running. <laughs> okay, so the idea with this election is that there are many candidates, and the voters have to rank a number of them. In New York, it was five. In Alaska, there will be four. So you rank your top five candidates in decreasing order. Then you run plurality, you apply the plurality rule. If someone gets more than 50%, that's the winner and we are done. If someone, no one gets more than 50%, then the candidate that had the least number of votes is dropped. Now, this candidate may have been ranked first by some voters. The vote of this voter still counts in the sense that they give their voter to the second candidate in the ranking. Now we have a new tally and we repeat the plurality until there is only one winner because eventually someone will have more than 50%. So what differs from place to place is how many people they can, how many candidates can, they can rank. As I said, in, in, in Alaska there are four, in New York, uh, where Adams won, we're five. Uh, and that's, that's also called instant runoff because one election takes place, which is different from what's happening with the presidential election in France, uh, where the, the, the applied plurality, the top two are going to a runoff in the second. This is instead what you're talking about, instant runoff. The argument is that it gives more representation, other voices are heard. The city council today in San Jose said it's too complicated, we're going to disenfranchise voters. I personally don't think this is good. They should educate the voters and help them, help them go and vote rather than uh, infantilize them and say, oh, they, they cannot, they cannot uh, think how difficult the system is. So in fact, the, the headline said the controversial rank based choice. So I think this is not good. One other question. Given what you said about the border, Yes. Okay, so why did your department use it? Border? Did, didn't you say that that's what was used at some point? Yeah, yeah, we used, we used for a while. I mean, I think I remember, I learned it from David. Why did we use it? Why did we stop using it? Why did you use it in the first place, given that it was? Uh, uh, well, uh, no, but border, is, border has here the problem. We did not have the problems that we explained here. We did not have incomplete information. We were able to rank the candidates. So that, that's easy to compute the border in that case. Uh, the Condorcet had other reasons. Borda is subject to manipulation more easily than the other rules are. Okay, Borda is one of the easier rules to manipulate. And I think that was Condorcet's objection to. So, so Kian, you've talked about um, manipulation there's a little bit of talk about fairness. Is there a way to formalize those notions and then test? Yeah, ma what? Man manipulation is absolutely formalized. It has been formalized for many years now, manipulation in voting. And uh, there are even spectacular theorems that say if you have more than three voters, then every rule is manipulable. And that's a result of Gibbard and uh, Satterthwaite from the 70s. A philosopher and an economist independently discovered that. Fairness is a much more difficult problem. Everybody would like to formalize fairness. Uh, I think in, the, in one of the, the last conferences I attended practically in person, uh, it was a database conference, someone had 23 proposals for, for fairness. And uh, this is very important because of the societal implications in decision making when the decisions are made by algorithms. And uh, uh, there, are, there is also some work coming from uh, one, one piece of this work comes from John Kleinberg at Cornell, who tried to prove the analog of Arrow's theorem for fairness, which some version is true, but the question is how much will, what can we do with this? I don't know this work very well, but it's absolutely fascinating that, yeah. So, so manipulation has been studied, formalized. Uh, we 
basically we have classification theorems for rules that are manipulable and how difficult it is to manipulate because the, the Gibbard uh, uh, Sutter wave result is more qualitative, but you can quantify how difficult it is. Uh, thank you, and uh, I have been always uh, very interested in uh, election, but my methodology uh, is always use statistics. That's, that's a common methodology to analyze the uh, elections, and, and I'm very exciting to, excited to know that uh, it's, it, it's, it can be also a database problem. <laughs> So, so I, 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 I will read more um, uh, literature about this. Uh, uh, what you have talked about, but so, so my current my question is: uh, Do you think there is uh, any uh, security problems other than manip manipulation in this uh, uh, election database? There's obvious security problems if you tamper with the with the vote. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. but that's that's we're not touching. We're not considering that. That's right. So I mean, I I'm just ask for your opinion and do you have some uh, this kind I, of idea in have, mind? I don't and have a, so so that anything, anything I'm, I'm very interesting. Yeah, okay. And, and by the way, uh, the title of the lecture was some aspects. I was very <laughs> carefully chosen. I don't want I don't want to indicate this was an all encompassing. I gave you a tiny little sliver. That's of right. this vast area, right? Mm -hmm. So this sure. is, a, and the positional scoring rules are only a small family of rules. There is Condorcet rule, there is the Maximin rule, there is the Bucklin rule, the, there is a whole bunch of other uh, Copland uh, rule, uh, which is actually essentially what uh, Ramon Lull had, had discovered. So, uh, so stat statistics, yes, can be used also there. Uh, um, what Roger asked, there are probabilistic aspects to this. Um, I'm, I'm, I only presented a very small. <laughs> OK, Even. thank you very much.